Well, CJ has been a friend for a lot of years, and he was in town visiting here for a couple days with two of his sons. And I have always known that CJ lost his father quite unexpectedly, but I didn't know a lot of the details around that. And so he was gracious enough to share some of those with me with the camera on and with a microphone. I think that, that some of you might get something out of this. Now, CJ kind of has a unique perspective on this because he his career is in estate planning, which means he is kind of planning for and talking about and helping people uh, address their mortality on a daily basis. And he's got you know a, a, quite a bit of experience with it in his own personal life as well, separate from his father. I hope you listen to this. There's the first half of the conversation we're talking about his father and fatherhood in general. The second half, we're talking a little bit more about estate planning. And if you haven't gone through estate planning and learned the basics, this would probably be a really good just kind of overview for you to understand why it is important and the basics. And there's even some things you can do that don't cost anything that, in as he'll describe, in, in some cases can save people um, enormous. So I hope you listen to it. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for tuning in. about I want to talk about your dad first but maybe just start like in a linear fashion almost like his career because I know he's a builder or a concrete guy to some extent but maybe start with the time he was kind of a a mini adult um and then with you guys coming up as kids and what was his career like yeah so he was born and raised in a small mountain town up in uh eastern northeastern Arizona ironically eager Arizona and that's kind of where our heritage comes from but he uh my mom and him got married. They're both from that small town and came down into uh, Phoenix. And this is the funniest. Nobody knows this uh, about my dad. Very few people know this about him. But he, um, despite his background, he's like, I'm going to go be a school teacher. And what, what was his background? So just, uh, you know, working at the mills up in the mountains. And um, uh, they ran a gas station up oh. there and stuff like that. So just kind of that background to for him to come down and be like, you know what, I think I'm going to go be a, huh. you know, junior high school teacher. Huh. Uh, everyone was like, what? You know, and, and he just kind of had like this desire, like, I, I think I want to teach. I want to, you know, lead in that way. And so I, I've heard this. I heard this from him growing up and I heard it from, I just had a client actually come to my office and they knew him from like back in the day. And they're like, you know, your dad wanted to be a school teacher. And I'm like, <laughs> I did yeah, <laughs> I actually knew that. And they're like, and uh, anyways, the what the way he told the story was he um, he did one day of student teaching at a junior high, and um, <laughs> he walked in and 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 from what my dad told me and what this other guy told me, they said, yeah, apparently he walked in, started teaching, and some kid mouthed off to him. And the way my dad was raised, it's like, well, I'm gonna go light into this kid, and but he like instantly felt restrained, like, well, I can't do anything. And he said, just that feeling of knowing like, this is just the way these kids are going to go. This is like going to get worse. And he said he had the distinct feeling like, I can't do anything to this kid. Like, sure, I can like send him to the principal. That doesn't teach him anything. And so he's like, he had this sick feeling. And he went home that day and told my mom, I'm going to go work construction. I'm out. And he never went back. Went one day. So student teaching happens like right before you, that's like the last step after you kind of finish your schooling yeah. and you're like about ready to go. Yeah. And, you, and then he's done. He's he was like, like, I can't yeah. do this. He's yeah. like, it, it, he just said, he just felt like this weird, this weird shift in his heart where he's like, wait a minute, this kid is just mouthed off. This is going to be every day. And I can't teach these kids the way I want to teach them. And it's only going to get worse. And so he, I think like that week, started wow. framing houses <laughs> what was that did your mom ever talk about that like she was kind of like what it was that was that like a I've major thing like it, for them that's kind of like a career change you, you know? know i don't know a lot of good yeah. good women in our lives who just i think she just supported him and was like whatever i say that because when i told Allie when i quit my accounting job and i was like i'm gonna buy i'm gonna flip houses right uh that did not that was not a good day for oh, her. Yeah. <laughs> it no. was like a bomb went off like in her no. like you know 
I've idea done, of what the future was going to look like. Yeah, I've done <laughs> I've done a thousand of those things where my wife is like, I'm going to kill you. Exactly. Uh, She's like, excuse no. me? I think, I don't know. I think uh, the tides shifting back then were maybe a little more yeah. accepted. I don't know. So he started framing and yeah. just like dug into building. He had a brother who was his best friend, Evan Eager. And uh, he was already working for a company called Farnsworth Homes, which uh, back in Arizona, anyone who's from that area, you'll know back in like the 50s and 60s, th- there's a guy named Ross Farnsworth who um, apparently, I mean, don't quote me on this, but apparently was kind of like a forerunner in um, like retirement communities. Oh, In fact, I think there's like some like paramount court cases that have happened in the country revolving oh. around like HOAs and like 55 plus communities. Yeah. And um and Ross Farnsworth was kind of at the center of all that cuz he was developing those and yeah, on so, the edge of kind of creating them. That's right. So so the Farnsworth name is pretty big yeah. in the valley and um it all started with Ross senior. He's appar- apparently he was a school teacher too. Oh, wow. He was actually a school teacher and he got this idea. He saw like a big I, I'm friends with some of his his grandkids. And in fact, one of them is a partner with me at the firm. Oh. And uh, and he, from what the stories I've heard is they said, yeah, he like saw this big chunk of land way out east in the valley. And he had kind of heard of like these ideas of doing these retirement communities. He's like, I'm going to do this. And he like got a loan somewhere, bought this huge track of land. Is like, we're doing this. And wow started pulling in all these connections and he's like, yeah, we're going to make this like a retirement feel, which apparently from what I've been told, that was kind of like a novel idea. Like, yeah. like a community revolved around retirees. Uh, and, um, which again, I think some like fundamental HOA laws that are established in this country started from like hi- communities like his at that yeah. time. Well, I'm sure like minute one, when somebody's like, Nobody under fifty five allowed. Right. Somebody was right. like, uh, yeah, "You can't do that. You can't do that." And they're like, "Well, let's sort it out." And right. now we all know. Right. So, so that was going on. Um, I mean, that that was so. Here, Farnsworth Homes is like in this huge expansion of like this. I mean, they've got people coming from the Midwest, from the yeah. Dakotas, Minnesota, just people retiring here like crazy. And so, Farnsworth Homes is booming. Uh, my uncle Evan was working there. My dad says, I'm done. I'm not, I'm never going to go back in a classroom huh. and just jumps on framing. So he was actually a framer Whoa. Uh, at, during that time. And, um, and uh, was, so I think my dad's brother was actually kind of his boss, so to speak, yeah. at least the foreman on the, on the cruise. And, um, and so he framed and then most framers have, have kind of who are smart, at least morph into yeah. kind of job site management and the foreman's. And is that kind of that's what exactly what happened? Did? He he was like, all right, we're going to he knew. And, and I've heard snippets of the stories from my mom and dad. But yeah, like kind of working his way up the command. I mean, you know, you, in order to become a foreman, I mean, you know, you got to have those management skills and things and my dad definitely had that stuff so got to that point where he was a foreman and then um you know kind of interesting blending of topics here but uh when people die (laughs) it creates a vacuum and i from the story i heard was that i think someone passed away that was like a superintendent and um i think my dad kind of not wanting to be the squeaky wheel, but at the same time, I think uh, from what I, the story I heard is he kind of walked into the the boss's office like, it's it's time, you know, it's time to make me a superintendent. Otherwise, I'm ready to walk and wow. and uh, kind of stuck his neck out and they got that position. And fast forward, uh, you know, forty years later, he he was the president of Farms with Homes. So he basically spent his career starting as a framer. Yeah. So not to spoiler alert slash cut to the chase, but talk about your dad's retirement and then he passed away yeah. unexpectedly and maybe just start a year or two before he passed and kind of talk through that. Like, yeah. Uh, so, you know. uh, yeah. So I, um, I was getting ready, you know, uh, all growing up, my dad made me and my brothers work at Farnsworth during the summers oh. and, um, and you know, I know a lot of kids like, hey, I worked at like the local sandwich shop or, yeah. you know, I was a lifeguard at the neighborhood pool. <laughs> like we weren't really allowed to do that at my house. Yeah. And I found out later why. I mean, obviously my dad wanted us to learn 
maybe some trades and learn how to work hard, hard work, because that's what that is. But um, later, I actually found out from my mom. She said, you know why he made you do that, right? And I was like, no. And she said, he wanted, he wanted your time. And I said, what do you mean? She said, he wanted to make sure that you were always with the family so that when we were going to go to a reunion that summer, you couldn't be like, oh, I've got work because he oh. was your boss. Oh, and interesting. He, In other words, not not the time, like the hours of the day where you're working. Right. But, but if there was something else, you wanted That's to go right. camping yep. or a family reunion. That's exactly right. You could make it. Oh, we're going on this family trip. My dad's like, well, your boss said you get off work. Oh, that's- You know, as opposed to like, because, you know, he wants to be a honorable man and say, well, if, if you have a boss at the sandwich shop right, that says you have to work. Don't let him down. Yeah, don't let him down. And yet I need you to be with the family. And so my mom told me years like that's the only reason he made us do that was he wanted to dedicate his time to the family and said, if he was your boss, then that means you got the time off when you needed it wow. uh, for family stuff. So, so anyway, so he did that. So we all worked out there and we all actually, he always put us on the concrete crew, the STEM crews. So, um, from a young age, we worked on these concrete crews and you know, that's, I remember trying to quit once yeah. and i remember him like totally calling me out on it yeah. and uh just putting me in my i you're like a teenager I, I was a teenager and i was a thinker i i wasn't much of a meathead in that regard i i love to manipulate people like any teenager did and i i felt like i could manipulate my dad and i remember one day i came home and i was like these guys on this crew <laughs> they're like the sickest you know <laughs> saying like the worst things i've ever heard in my <laughs> life and jokes I yeah don't know. <laughs> and when really all i all i did was i didn't like waking up at 3 30 in the morning you know but i was like i was like dad how you can't put me in this environment like <laughs> like dude, this is like the worst you're like the worst dad ever to, to put a kid in that environment and, he, and i remember like he didn't he didn't give a rebuttal but he also didn't say anything yeah and didn't let me off the hook and he's like nice try like you 3.30 tomorrow again. So He's like, you should think about law school. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and, and that's why I tell everyone, you know, he, he made me work concrete. So I said he, he probably figured that if I, if I, uh, if he made me do that long enough, I'd, I'd maybe eventually go to college, which is tr- <laughs> he totally tricked me and it worked. Um, but yeah, but no, we worked concrete crews and that's, um, that's a good, you know, I mean, obviously your, your listeners will appreciate that, that like, that some of the best life lessons you could ever get yeah. come out of out of some of those environments, good or bad, you know. And and I I learned so much working those crews, and even just to see some of these guys who you know no no real like college education or anything, but some of my crew bosses, you know, here I am watching them like run measurements from corner to corner on stem walls on the forms, and I'm like sitting here thinking like, oh, these guys are a bunch of meatheads, you know, like, yeah. like whatever. And all of a sudden I like watch them. And I, and I remember one day asking this guy, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm, I'm running the measurements it, yeah. and he's doing the Pythagorean theorem, yeah. you know, yeah. from corner to corner. And I'm like, oh yeah, this dude's doing more math than I'll ever do in yeah. my life. Yeah. My, I don't think the viewers can see, have seen this in our videos. It can't come through, but my dad, his brain in terms of calculating and adding, subtracting, converting decimals and fractions, all, is right. a calculator. It's like that meme of the guys like numbers whizzing around. And there's a lot of uh, tradesmen who can do that. And right. holy cow, it's like you almost have to see it to believe it because it's like you, it's easy to judge uh, right. a, a guy with a little dirt under his fingernails or, or worse. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, wow, I don't know how you did that. But <laughs> right. So did your dad retire like officially from Farnsworth? Yeah. So um, he actually never retired. He, um, he was uh, like... Um, so it would have been like 2008, 2009. He um, had worked his way up pretty high up the ladder. And just about 2008, 2009, he had uh, gotten this like final promotion. He was the president of Farnsworth Homes, which is a pretty big deal um, because about that time, I mean, Farnsworth is a monster, like yeah. thousands and thousands of homes in the Valley. Uh, what, four or five master plan communities out there. Mm-hmm. Um, just a huge industry. And so for him to start as a framer and w- work his way up like that was a pretty awesome story. I mean, rare story for someone to do that, you know, and um, um, awesome. And then um, he was, but he was getting ready. Uh, 
to retire. He was looking forward to that in the next four or five years mm. and started kind of making those plans to retire. And the, and the Farnsworth was wrapping up a master community, mm-hmm. what would be their last one. And so it was kind of like a good, a nice yeah. period uh, at the end of all this, uh, maybe an exclamation point, but um, yeah. And then, I mean, the, the crux of that is I was, I had gone away to law school and um, getting ready for my final exam, uh, one of my final exams for for law school, and uh, and I got a phone call. It was it was the night before my exams. I'm cramming, going through all these notes. I've got like a pile of notes, like you wouldn't believe, and I'm just like doing one final cram to get ready for this torts exam. I remember uh, for in law school and. Uh, I'm just like trying to like process my thoughts and like get everything dialed in of things that I thought mattered. And and truly in that moment, that's all that matters, right? Yeah. Nothing else matters right now. It's just, just going through legal theories and and preparing for this exam. And um, at about five o'clock uh, that night, I'm going through and I, I get a phone call and I see that it was my brother and I was like, almost didn't take it because I'm like, I can't focus on distractions right now and then at the last second i'm like okay fine i'll answer the phone and i answered it and my brother just told me that something horrific had happened and I, you know i didn't and he's like what i said what what's going on and uh he said i think something really bad happened to dad and um and uh i said what and i said i we, we don't know but we think he had a stroke and um and he said mom's rushing him to the hospital right now and uh so I didn't, I was like, you know, you, you tend to like try to think of all the positive thing. Like, oh, like, well, they're going to take care of him. Doctors oh, yeah. are great and he's going to be fine. And and then about 30 minutes later, I think it was my mom that called me and she just, mm-hmm. I could almost like hear her shaking her head and uh, on the phone it was, and she's just like, it's, he's not going to make it. And I couldn't believe it. And I'll I'll never forget hanging up the phone and I just walked over to all those notes and stacks of papers that I thought were so important and the only thing that mattered. And truly, like in that moment, you'd say, yeah, that is the only thing that matters. And just walking up to that stack of notes and just closing it and just being like, this doesn't matter. You know, none of this matters. And um, yeah, I just went over to my computer and shopped for a plane ticket to leave the next morning. To come home so. so you're probably like 25 or 26 or yeah. somewhere in there yeah and 26 it's kind of funny because i think there's a, a lot of people i'm not one of them who've experienced living a portion of their entire life without a dad or a father figure yeah. and i and i feel like you've like are straddling that because you had the first half of your life with with the ultimate father probably kind of like mine just like you know living legend everybody loves him and yeah. taught you everything and then and when you're 25, right, when you have at least one kid, maybe a couple and a bunch more coming over the next decade, yeah. when you're kind of like, in some ways, needing your dad as much as ever, just for different reasons. Right. Now you've had 15 years or however long with, without a dad. So what's that been like? Yeah. So shortly, I there was a lot going on right, right in that moment, but um, there's something... This guy who who lived in our neighborhood at the time, he came up to me um, like the day after the funeral, and he said something to me that um, that kind of it sound it rolled off his tongue a little weird, and it kind of felt weird when he said it, but now, eleven years later, I can tell you, it was the most impactful thing that maybe or maybe impactful in my mind. He said, um, right after the funeral, he came up to me and said, hey, I, I lost my father not long ago. Uh, and of course, he's a grown man. Like, a, you know, he's probably in his late 50s. And he said, I lost my father long ago, or not long ago. And he said, you know, CJ, um, you're about to find out what, it's, what it is to be a real man. And I was like, again, that didn't sound... Like, and then he, he, he said, you, you, you never become a real man until your father's not here. He said something like that. And, and of course mm. you would have to understand how he meant it. Like he didn't mean like, oh, you're not a man unless you lose your father. Of course. But, but he meant just like, 
you're about to find out what it's what it's like to be a real man now that your father's gone. And I was like, that was weird. Yeah. Um, but um, so why was that impactful to me? Um, over the last 11 years, you know, my dad, I mean, he, he was, you and I have talked about this, like it was just, you know, all of us, uh, those of us who have really larger than life fathers, and there's a lot who don't have that and and we respect that. But f- when you have like this larger than life father, my, my dad was a cowboy. He rode horses. He was a gritty guy. And he, he commanded a lot of respect when he entered a room and people felt that and people talked about him like he was larger than life, even though when you grow up with them, you don't totally feel that, uh, sometimes. And, and, um, so, so, um, when he passed away, it, it, it became, he was someone that I, oh, you, you, well, you feel this conflict growing up with a guy like that and you have your own conflicts with your father. But when you get about the ages of early twenties, mid twenties, I'm sure a lot of people relate to this. For a lot of us, that's when your relationship with a father starts to shift. And all of a sudden you start feeling like, almost like you're on equal footing with each other. And like, like you're kind of becoming more of a friend to me now. And all of a sudden, like the things I care about, you care about, like I'm, I'm angry that my water heater's not working. And that's something that you're, you care about too. And I'm mad about taxes and you're mad about taxes. Yeah. And why am I paying into social security? And you've been paying into social security, you know, like yeah. all of a sudden all these like adult things, you start sharing them together. And ideally there's zero of him, like either, or a father, either manipulating or controlling or advising or like fathering in a, right. in a super hands-on way. And and like you solving your water heater problem, like that's your problem yeah. on your shoulders. And so in some ways that put like, there's an equal footing aspect to that moment. I know that right. feeling. Yeah. And so that's an interesting, it's an interesting, and I, I will never forget right about that age. So I was 26, he was 62. In fact, when he died and, um, and so we just started feeling that connection, that bond to where like, he, I felt like he was parenting can shift right you can still be a really good parent even to an adult child and but your approach probably shifts as we've all experienced and my dad i felt him starting to shift like he didn't feel responsible to put his thumb on me anymore but he did advise he became like a counselor all of a sudden you know an advisor uh and and that advice and counsel is huge and um and especially in your early years when you're getting a career going and I'm making these big decisions. In fact, when when your father passes away, there are some things that he will have told you in your life that will stick out and will, for better or worse, govern how you do things for the rest of your life. My dad was very conservative with money. He was very conservative in business. He didn't take big risks and he was very calculated in that respect. One of the last things he told me before he died, I'll never forget, I was visiting with him and I told him about this um, this like business little investment I was going to do. And um, I, oh, I went to him with the idea because I knew he would be against it. Mm-hmm. And I almost wanted that validation. For like I wanted him to tell me not to do it so that I would feel validated in my decision. And I went to him and told him this idea and he didn't tell me to do it or not to do it, but I will never forget. He looked at me and he said, you know, CJ, I maybe should have stuck my chin out more in business. And that's all I said. Because of that one sentence he told me right before he died. And of course, I didn't know he was going to pass away. That one sentence, I have done some crazy things in my life. Probably he would probably disapprove of every one of them. But but because of that one sentence he told me, I have taken risks in business and in life because I hear him telling me to not be afraid to stick my chin out. Now, sometimes I stick my chin and my neck out and that's probably too much. But um but that one thing has really governed how I run my life. So so um that life advice that a father can give is so critical and now that he's gone and that guy comes to me and says you're about to learn what it's like to be a man Mm. uh, now that your father's gone i have seen that play out 
and seen it illustrated in some weird ways. Um, when I have these big decisions to make mm. that any one of us would turn to an advisor or a counselor to say, hey, what do you think about this? Well, he's not there. He's not there and it's me. And I'm the one who has to make that. I'm my own counselor and advisor and I'm the one who has to make that final call. And this, by the way, this isn't like a pity party. I'm, yeah. I'm just illustrating like- is, is that like the gist of what that guy was saying that like all of you know your family, possibly your, I don't know, yeah. brothers and siblings and who, whoever, like it's kind of on your shoulders without a- back right. up you know like that's another right. another net of you know father to kind of like is that kind of what he was Th that's exactly to? right he he was basically saying and he kind of got into it a little more is like you are the backstop yeah there is no safety net yeah. there is no there is no what do you think yeah it's people now asking me what i think yeah. you know and and when i run into a problem or an issue or a business decision or an investment or a it's like and and um and this is going to sound weird, but now that my dad is gone, um, it uh, there are some weird blessings that come from that. And, and and what I mean by that is like, like I'm I'm thankful if I fail at something, mm -hmm. and and I know that it was me, <laughs> and I yeah. can't blame other people, and 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 to that extent, I have to kind of man up and own what I do now to a far greater degree than like quickly turning to someone and being like, yeah. help me here, get me out of this yeah, or bail show me out, bail right? me out of this uh, contract deal with yeah. this, this deal with this uh, subcontractor went bad. Help me out. It's like, yeah, there is no, that. yeah. It's There's probably some people listening who didn't have the luxury of having a great father from a young age and felt that man told her that weight of being a real man, you know, maybe when they were 10 for the first time, what do you think about, and how do you think about people, you know, having to adopt father figures, you know, for a time? And I'm, do you have some father figures right now who, to some extent, are you're able are able to fill that role? Because I know for younger people, uncles and older brothers and yeah. neighbor dads, like it's it's not saying it's like better than nothing. It's like no, very much those that those roles can be filled by by other people so how do you totally. how do you think about that and what's that like for you now yeah i think it's critical i think i think you're doing yourself a huge disservice and you're like forcing yourself to be alone if you aren't finding those people and influences that and and <laughs> for those for those listening who have maybe have didn't have a father growing up or had for lack of a better term a crappy father who yeah. was just there's lots of deadbeats out there. And, and for those of you who did have that, I mean, there's a lesson to be learned in everything and every experience of life. And you may, you may have had to do exactly what that gentleman told me. You may have had to become a man a lot quicker, uh, in your life. And, and, um, that's okay. That's okay. I, I, I think, um, I think as uh, men in this world, I think we all have to rise up. You know, like we have to rise up and fulfill those roles. And you are either being mentored or you're mentoring someone. And so, if you don't have that in your life, you you should be that to someone else. And and uh, and if you need guidance and you need that mentorship, go find someone. Some of the most influential people. So, I just got done saying, oh, I you know everything stops with me, but that's not true. Uh, you know. I look to some of my dad's my dad's close friends as as guys who knew my dad. They know what my dad would have done in certain situations, um, and they have they have reached out to me on a few different occasions, and I've had to reach out to them on a few different occasions on certain situations um, that, that you always need counsel. You always need an advisor. And, yeah. and there are those people, it could be a school teacher, a, you yeah. know, a neighbor, like you're saying, a neighbor dad, that's, that's one of the best examples. Some of the, some of the men who still influenced me to this day are guys that were in my neighborhood who, yeah. and, and kudos to them for being men enough to know, to reach out to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Okay. So I'm, how old am I? 37, but they still know like, Hey, you don't have a dad and you probably need this influence and 
and they'll reach out to me from time to time. And I, I really appreciate that. I think it's really neat. So what happens when someone dies unexpectedly and we'll, I'm sure we'll end up with some nitty gritty about estate planning, but mm. in general, like the, when someone passes away unexpectedly, it is so complicated and like insane. And you're, this is kind of your life now in terms of helping people plan for that. But, um, maybe since we're talking about contractors and concrete in general, but yeah. I mean, at that time, for example, your dad worked for the company. So I'm sure they, there was people who could kind of, uh, kind of get the jobs done, but Fill I'm in. thinking about like a contractor, you know, the job right. halfway done who passed away. In fact, um, my, the bookkeeper that I use for a couple of years, she's amazing lady. Her husband passed away. He's a painter quite unexpectedly. Yeah. And the house was half painted he just as a teeny example, but, uh, man, what, uh, what a complicated like mess. And I'm sure there, I'm sure you've got some stories of complications that are almost like unfathomable, uh, with businesses and yeah, payroll, who knows? Yeah. So, I mean, if you're a, if you're, so yeah, to your point, I, that's what I do. I'm a, an estate planning attorney and I have lots of, lots of, uh, clients who are contractors who have some have passed away and like the number one thing i like to go over with my clients if you own you know if you're a cabinetry guy a framer uh you know you're an electrician the number one question i typically ask folks is if you die does your business have value and and you got to be honest with yourself mm -hmm. like if you're a tradesman you got to be honest if i die today does the business die with me? Mm -hmm. And and to some of you listening, the answer is yes. It, it's, you know, you, you do a unique style of painting and this and that, and then you die. Okay, well, you're that's dead yeah, with you. you. No employees and right. like one you're, truck. <laughs> yeah, one truck. Your inventory is low. Yeah. Okay, you're, you, that's it. But, but on the flip side, I have a lot of clients, and some of you listening may say, hey, no, I do have... I have thousands of dollars of inventory. Um, I have employees, I have staff, and to top it off, I have bids. I have job I have open jobs, right? And some of some of my clients, yeah, they they go job to job to job. But some people, some of you listening would say, no, I've got on any given day, I've got 15 jobs open and we're working on those things. Well, you add that those jobs up. And you say, okay, well, the, those jobs alone are worth, you know, six figures. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, I do have staff and I do have all this inventory. And definitely I have something that's worth money when I die. Even if it was just to be sold. Yeah. Let's say your spouse says, hey, I'm going to sell. I, could your spouse sell the company? Yeah. Is there enough goodwill that someone would buy your company? And if someone, if you say, yeah, no, I do have inventory. I have these jobs. I have these contracts. A perfect example of that um, I had shared with you before is a, a client of mine who um, he owned a concrete company uh, there in the valley and um, he passed away and he was the sole proprietor of this huge concrete company um, and he owned it as an LLC and this uh, LLC he had that we came to the conclusion he had over two million dollars in pending contracts, like with like the public schools and and other organizations, and we kind of talked it through uh, um, after the fact. And what had happened is he passed away totally unexpected, and when he passed away, his his widow came into our office and said, "Hey, um, you know we've got forty employees." They're working on all these huge jobs. Um, and this is the only way I make money now because we've been you know, private business owners our whole lives. And this is the only way I make money. And I said, okay, can you keep running the business? She said, I probably can, to be honest with you. We've got enough foremen and enough guys that we could probably keep this thing alive and well. She said, I'm, only, I'm just running into one huge problem. And I said, what's that? And she says, we have a uh, payday is coming up. And nobody is legally authorized to run payroll because he was the sole proprietor of this company. He, he was the only one that owned it. She's not a signer on the accounts. Nobody's. So she said, how do I get access to those accounts? Well, unfortunately, you have to go to the courts mm -hmm. and open up a probate proceeding 
that would give you access over those. And that could take anywhere from a month to six months, you know, depending on how long that process takes wow. and depending on how long and how backlogged the courts are. Mm. And I'll never forget, she looked at me and she goes, I don't have a month. <laughs> I, 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 these guys are going to be gone. Yeah. Uh, come Tuesday, if there is not money in their accounts, gone. they are gone. Yeah. And I looked at it, and this is the saddest thing. And I had to look at it and I said, then your company's gone. Mm. And it is, it's gone. Really? And down, down the toilet, that whole company just got flushed because there was nobody who had legal authority to take over the company. Um, and, and think of it, she, had they done it the right way, she could have kept those contracts alive and well turned around, sold those contracts to another contractor mm -hmm. and cashed out on $2 million worth of bids. Yeah. Uh, you know, feasibly. Yeah. And then all this inventory that they could have sold to go with those projects. Yeah. It could have just been a, a nice... Yeah, she, she could have probably like sold the business to her lead foreman. And right. Worked out financing and just you take... And just kind of helped move it over to him. That's right. And... Or not even, or not even turn over to him. Just give him a promotion, right? And say keep yeah. running the company, there and she go. keeps getting a paycheck for the rest of her life. So, the, in the extreme, I'm sure there's like super fancy estate planning that you could recommend, but I don't want to talk about that. But what about like if you were telling somebody like if nothing else, at least right. do this. Like for me, I'm almost forty, and I have like let's say whatever assets I have in general. If you're talking to somebody who or a contractor, like the person you described, they got a little business, yeah. they got a two crews, cut some trucks. And if you're saying like, okay, if you don't want to like do the whole, you know, deal, spend a bunch of money, fine. If nothing else, please, I'm, right. for the love of God, please do this <laughs> right. one thing. What is that? Well, uh, like in all things, there's like a good, better and a best yeah, that well, you can do in life. Uh, a good option is make sure that there's somebody else that's a signer on accounts, right? right. Someone that you obviously trust. Yes. And, and this obviously isn't anything I recommend to like, my legal clients because right. I'm going to try to get them the best protection. Right. But a very simple solution is ask yourself today, if I died, does somebody have access to our accounts? Yeah. Does somebody have access to run payroll? Yeah. Not just access because a lot of people get confused by that. Like, yeah, my wife knows my password. No, not the password. Does she have legal authority yeah. to write checks yeah. from your accounts? Yeah. Uh, does or or maybe you have a trusted, trusted, trusted right hand that you work with yeah. that you have given access to accounts, things like that. So that's if nothing, that's free. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's the free answer. Yeah. Is is does somebody have the authority to step in and make legal decisions on behalf of? The, and that's that gets a little dicey too, right? Because you say, well, that's all good because yeah, my spouse does have access. Okay, but. Does someone have legal authority to bind contracts, right? Like your wife can't like go settle up a contract with somebody. Uh. Like she doesn't have legal authority to do that depending on how big the deal is. Mm -hmm. So that, that can be a little tricky, but that is at least a good solution. Like if nothing else, ask yeah. yourself today, does somebody have legal access yeah. to step in and speak for the company slash write checks for the company? Yeah. That would be a great, a good. And it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, and that doesn't cost anything. Um, the next one is obviously like getting a last will and testament in place, you know, something that says what you want done. Um, and with that, with a company that you're running a company, you can actually put a very simple operating agreement in place. None of it. I mean, you, you can go online and find operating agreements mm -hmm. that can be dangerous uh, to, to just cup cut, copy, and paste stuff on off of the internet. But if you're doing this competently, get an operating agreement that explains what happens mm -hmm. to your company. Part of that is what's called a buy-sell agreement. But mm -hmm. yeah, if I die tomorrow, this is exactly what happens uh, to my company when I die. So at least we know exactly what was to happen and who has authorities to step in. And then the good, better, and the best, um, a lot of people don't realize that you can actually form a really simple basic trust mm -hmm. and your LLC or your corporations, they can actually be owned by a trust. Mm. And so your trust can actually, if you were to die tomorrow, it's all good because, you know, uh, Elite Cabinetry LLC wasn't owned by me, the decedent. It was actually owned by uh, the Eager Family Trust. 
Mm-hmm. And the Eager Family Trust has a long line of successor trustees that can step in at any given moment and run payroll, mm-hmm. sign checks, bind contracts, mm-hmm. um, and then most importantly, sell the business, mm-hmm. right? Say, hey, we are going to strike a deal with somebody. And by the way, we have legal authority to do that. Um, I have a family member that um, owns a bunch of restaurants and um, bringing in these minority owners, right? Oh, like investors? Yeah. And it's like, okay, you own 1% of the restaurants now, you know? And we got to visiting about that. And it's like, hey, did you know if that one... You know, I, I, told, I told my family member, I said, hey, like tomorrow, if some big restaurateur came up and said, I'm going to buy you out, uh, would you sell? And he's like, oh my gosh, in a heartbeat. You know, like, I, I, like, yeah. wh- wh- who is this person? Uh, <laughs> Where do I sign? Who, yeah, who are you talking about? <laughs> um, and he said, oh yeah, I would definitely sell in a heartbeat. And I said, okay, well, you're bringing in all these little half a percent, 1% owners mm. and they're lining up and they're stacking up, right? I said, on any given Thursday, if one of these people dies and you were in one year along in a negotiated contract, you realize that whole deal would fail because a half a percent owner died. And since their half a percent share can't be transferred because it's stuck in their name, wow. they would have to go through an entire probate proceeding wow. before you had authorization to sell your... So one little smit crumb of your company could cause an entire multi-million dollar transaction to come crumbling down mm. because the authority wasn't there to transfer shares. That's so funny. A lot of these legal things remind me of like like radio waves or the or internet Wi-Fi where it's like you can't or electricity. You can't yeah. see it. You can't smell it. I kind of don't know for sure that it exists based on my senses, like a trust. Ooh, right. I, mean, I have a trust now. And people talk about it like as if it was this table. Right. But and yet, right. like the fact that it is created out of thin air, let's say, yep. can move heaven and earth <laughs> at the right moment. Hey, what what was uh, COVID like in your industry? Um, oh, I know there's like more deaths, but aside from that and more people you know, passing away and probating, what in general happened in the industry? Oh, it's huge. I mean, we... <laughs> so I have this partner who um, at the firm, he's like my Zen master. He's, yeah. he's like always reading these deep doctrinal books. And he read one book that he shared with me. He said, Hey, I think you'd find this interesting. And I'll, I'll find out the name of the book and share it with you. But um, long story short, it's basically like in Eastern cultures. And, and forgive me for butchering this, but in Eastern cultures, you'll, you'll see like, like in India and China, like these elderly people walking around like homeless Right. Oh, wow. And they're all like, there's so many like elderly homeless people. And in our Western culture, if you go over there, you're like, who, who are these heartless people? Like these old, old men and old women that are like living in gutters. And the book explains, Hey, that's actually on purpose. And you're like, what? How is that on purpose? And the author goes on to explain that in Eastern cultures, Eastern cultures are far more ready to face their own mortality. And so they actually, in the accumulation of assets and running businesses, when they acquire these things, they acquire enough to see them through uh, prosperity only till about the midlife, 50s and 60s. And they do that on purpose so that by the time they hit their 50s and 60s, whatever they have left, they used to wind down their life wow. until where when they die, they die with nothing. Wow. They're like, yes, I, I I, went back to my homeless state and died. It's like, I want my last check to bounce. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, for them. And so, so there's almost like this, like respect and deference to like old homeless people back then. Like they are doing exactly what they've been preparing to do. That's very di- culturally different because- Death, we don't, in the U.S. at least. I That's mean, exactly it. I don't even know where a funeral home is. <laughs> and if I did see one, it just looks like it could be any old bakery for <laughs> all I know. There's like- That's you, exactly right. There, there, you don't see anything about death. Even the uh, cemeteries, Al and I were talking about cemeteries and how, at least around here, they're like, they're kind of out of sight. You kind of never are even rarely around graves. You definitely never see 
you know, uh, uh, a, uh, someone getting buried, right. unless you're kind of going your way. It's just not at all you're a right. part of. It, it, there is like a metaphorical like thing going on in the Western culture. And that's exactly what this author goes into basically right. saying, you know, uh, the, and sorry to do this on a podcast, but you know, th- there's like this bell curve yeah. for Eastern societies that like they accumulate and then they kind of just prepare to like end up with nothing. Western cultures, it is just a direct slope. It's Let's like acquire. accumulate, acquire, acquire, <laughs> acquire, and then one day just <laughs> dropping off the edge, right? <laughs> and it's just like a sharp drop huh. into pandemonium. And as we know, in field fighting, where families oh. literally destroyed themselves because there were so many assets oh. and so much disarray, and nobody was preparing to address their own mortality. Oh, so right. That's probably a big part of your business is just sort of uh, helping families negotiate. Oh, or is that more just huge. litigation? That maybe that's maybe estate planning is like the time for estate planning is <laughs> yeah, passed. It's gone. Now it's litigation. Well, that's true. But no, I mean, um, I mean, even on my way to Oregon, I had, I have a case going on where I have these kids. <laughs> they all have the same name, and I keep getting these emails, and I'm getting them confused, and they're all yelling. Oh, they're coming to me to yell at each other, and oh. and you know that's. You're exactly right. That when when someone passes away, the time for planning is over. Mm. And and unfortunately, so here in Western culture, I think we do kind of have that mindset of I'm gonna live forever. Yeah. I am immortal, but you are not. And yeah. and that is one guarantee. So you say, like, yes, estate planning, that sounds so stuffy. It sounds like like the most boring topic on earth. Um but unlike unlike um, you know, like we all like there's so many people who invest in like life insurance, right? Or like auto insurance, right? You may never, you might pay into life insurance or auto insurance for the rest of your life. And you may never use that. Mm-hmm. That's like kind of a depressing thought, like, holy smokes. I mean, I know it was there for assurance of insurance, right. but but like I paid for 70 years of auto insurance and I literally never used it once. Yeah. Estate planning is the opposite. You you are going to, for anyone who cares enough to say, hey, I'm going to face my mortality for just a brief minute, right? I am going to face the fact that 100% I am going to use my estate plan. There is no if, ands, or buts. Studies have shown that all humans die uh, I mean, that's like, that's, that's a, a fact. Yeah. And so for anyone who's like, yeah, man, Interesting. I mean, I, I, I laugh at, I laugh at, I have so many clients who come in who like, yeah, I'm a high roller. I, I, I kill it at life. I'm worth over $6 million. And I'm like, and I like break down their estate and like 4 million of it is like life insurance. And I'm like, hmm. that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. You're not worth, yeah. you, you don't have $4 million. Your kids will have four million dollars. Yeah, worth four mi- six million dead. Dead, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Like, uh, I don't know if you're that. It, 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 and yet, and yet, they won't face their own estate plan. Like, hmm. when you pass away, you are one hundred percent going to die. So, for people who are like, "Oh man, that's that's such a lame topic," I, I know it is, but but maybe that's something we could glean from yeah. Eastern culture a little bit and be like, "Let's face our mortality a little bit earlier on." And for those of you who are running a business, I, I can tell you. The two things that cause families to absolutely be obliterated. You will never talk to your siblings ever again is... Wolves. Uh, yeah. yeah family <laughs> family businesses yeah. and and family legacy properties. Those, those two things, really? if you do not address that in an estate plan, it is the kiss of death. You, you might as well... You might as well, like, before you die, get your all your family... Like give them weapons and put them in like Hunger Games and be like, have fun. So uh, uh, some only one of you is gonna live. So some parents will be like, we want to leave our shopping mall to our kids, right? So they can have money. For, is that what you mean by like exactly. legacy property where they will try to move well, the asset or or the family cabin oh, or oh, or okay. the family beach house? Oh, got it. It and, could just or, be like leisure type. Like, oh, leisure. Property. Those are the worst ones because oh. then it's like because then it's like okay, we left this uh, family cabin to our four kids. Um, our one son is a um, a surgeon who makes millions of dollars every year, and our um, elementary school teacher daughter yeah. 
couldn't even afford the taxes on that cabin yeah, or the utility bill <laughs> well th- well then five years into it yeah well who gets to use it well the surgeon he's the one paying all the taxes and he's paying the rent you've never contributed once they will not talk yeah they hate each other for the rest of their life yep and, and i we deal with this all day long i beg my clients when they tell me we just want to leave huh. the cabin to the kids wow. and and go ahead and set aside 10 percent of the estate to pay for the first few years of built it's like Okay, so kick the can down the road for a few years, and then they'll kill each other. So, what do you tell them? Sell it. I, I, I sell oh. it. Have the trust sell it, and then liquidate the <laughs> proceeds. By the way, this is oh. happening in my own family. We have this. I mean, you've been up to that area. We have this big, like, family lodge. There are now. I came from this huge family up in the White Mountains. At this point, there's like a thousand people tied to this this lodge so it's like your, your grandparents or your yes. grandparents who my grandmother was one of 14 kids up oh, in the geez. white mountains and, and her parents and her parents established this thing oh my god and there is this huge and it's getting to the point where like you know they ask people hey everyone um taxes are coming due so everyone throw in 50 bucks and you know nobody does yeah. except for a few and and we're like six generations deep wow. and they finally came out of all these thousands of people. I think I'm the only lawyer. And they said, what would you do? And I said, um, so we need to put an agreement in place that in 15 years from now, the property is going to be sold. You would have thought I had, I had murdered someone. Killed grandma I mean, again. yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. I mean, you, there were like pitchforks and yeah. torches, like kill this guy. This, yeah. wh- who does he think he is coming in here telling us to sell this? But, but that's the only way. It's whoever is going to want to step up and buy it, then they can decide to let everyone else use it. But yeah. it is it is genuinely the only way. So, so yeah. So so this this I know it sounds hippy dippy to say, hey, let's let's glean from the Eastern cultures. But that is one thing that I would glean and say, maybe maybe kind of address your mortality early on. Face the fact that you are one hundred percent going to die. Yeah. And then say, okay, this isn't like I'm not going to be an ostrich with my head in the sand, like. I'm going to face this right now, put some stuff in writing and, and you'd be shocked. There's some estate planning stuff you can do for virtually nothing. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to go spend thousands and thousands of dollars on these trusts. I mean, there's some simple things you can do just to, if I die tomorrow, driving down the highway at at the very least, this would be. So what, what is, you probably get this question a lot. So I'll pose it in case people are thinking it. What, what do you tell people when they say, "What what does a ballpark cost to set up a trust? Is it like 5,000 bucks or 10,000 bucks? Or what What do people need to expect to spend for something like the Honda Accord yeah. of estate plans Yeah, so like a normal <laughs> right. family? That is a good comparison. The Honda Accord would be the right one to get. And, and by the way, um, lawyers are the worst. I, I am one. And so I'll tell you, they can, they can be the worst. And um, even just saying that word trust, yeah. that has a lot of like, there's like a thousand things that you could mean yeah. when you say that. But if someone says, I'm wanting to do my estate plan, they're they're really talking about, for, for most of us in America, uh, people are either getting a will in place or they're getting these revocable trusts. And those revocable trusts are also called a living trust, oh. a family trust, an inter vivos trust. It's all the same thing. In fact, I've had clients come back and be like, you... You did a revocable trust for me. My buddy on the golf course said I need a living trust. And I'm like, it's the same thing, man. (laughs) Yeah, same thing. Um, But yeah, so generally we're talking about these revocable trusts. And those trusts, um, this is something that you're never going to hear another lawyer say. So hopefully you're all like recording this and making fun of me for the rest of my life. I am not against LegalZoom or any of these other like online legal companies. I can guarantee you it's going to be a decent product product yeah. ultimately. Now the problem is, is that you don't have somebody showing you yeah. how these work. And if you don't see it through to the end, you might as well not have started. And that's mm-hmm. the problem with those things. It's probably a little bit like something's better than nothing. And yeah. it's so much better than nothing right. that go for it. Right. As long as you do it. <laughs> I remember I ordered uh, on, remember the Craig jig that you, uh, that you can make like a butt joint, like picture frames. There's like Craig jig thing that you okay. can put your, I remember I bought one when I was like 20 years old when they like first came out. I was like, this thing's awesome. And I bought it off of like some infomercial at the time before Amazon was around. And I didn't even know how to work it. And I remember to this day, it's just sitting there in my garage, like in its case. And I'm like, 
now I know how to work it, but yeah. But I'm just like, that was the stupidest purchase. I could have saved that money because uh, I bought something. I didn't even know how it functioned. That's kind of what happens frequently when people oh. buy stuff online. So I can't tell you <laughs> how many people say, hey, I want to come in. I want you to review my estate plan. I'm oh. like, sure, and I'll do it for free. You know, Come on in. They come in and it's documents that they bought online from one of these big box things and they're and it's completely wrong it's like puzzle pieces that don't fit together yes yes they're like wait so did i do this right i'm like i'm like you literally didn't even sign it hey, you know and they're like oh do i do i need to do that i'm like well no. yeah, the, the line where it says your name and then it says sign next to it that's the key indicator yeah um but but to to, to answer your question so what is the cost you could probably spend on one of these online retailers a couple hundred bucks but the answer is another one answer to that too is by the time you get everything that you should be getting in place even some of these online retailers yeah. it'll add up to almost what like yeah. our firm charges yeah so so you got to be a little bit careful there and also keep in mind when you call into those companies they will still bill hourly oh really yeah because they have an attorney who bills hourly yeah, there's got to be an attorney like yes. somewhere up the chain that's, that's exactly right so you got to be a little careful with that because then people are like mm. Well, I got all the legal documents in it. I'm about a thousand bucks into this thing. And then I tried to call them and they wanted my credit card information because mm. they have to bill an attorney. And I'm like, yeah, you could have just come to us and probably spent less. And they're like, yeah. what? So yeah. so be careful there. But the point is, yes, you if you went to a law firm or an estate planning group, you're probably going to spend anywhere from $900. And I mean this genuinely to 9,000. Mm -hmm. And this is the saddest part. Um, those very well could be the identical product. In other words, if some attorney tells you the it'll cost twenty thousand oh, dollars, then you should at least yeah. like pump the brakes and yeah. keep shopping. If, if it's twenty thousand dollars, they're doing something else for <laughs> Unless you. Unless you're like part of the Walton family <laughs> right. or right. something. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, don't get me wrong. And and you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the estate planning world. Government the the gov government right now is doing some weird things with estate plan uh, estate taxes and things that yeah. you, you'd want to talk to an attorney about if your estate was getting Big. into the millions mm. you, that should be a red flag uh, we should probably talk to someone who competently can navigate us through this but to answer your question how much does the trust cost anywhere in that range um i i personally think that you should never that most of americans you should never be into this over 2500 bucks wow i think if you're over that you are truly paying for prestige mm. that you don't want yeah that's my honest opinion and and, and I, i'm sure yeah. i just offended like half the country's <laughs> attorneys but but that is that is my honest answer yeah. you, you you're paying these these big firms who are going to print out a form trust that's 120 pages long and 120 of those pages yeah have nothing to do with you or your family yeah. or your estate. Okay, that makes sense. And it's like 98% of the good you can achieve in the yes. first, let's say, $2,500. After that, it's sort of like, yeah, yeah. I guess that wouldn't hurt. But right. in terms of like the meat and potatoes to avoid, you know, the the real catastrophic yep. family collisions. That's um, right. It's it's that, That's actually not too, uh, that's not too bad. You know, people no. spend, you spend that much on... Like I said, or like you said, um, auto insurance over a year that you you don't get that back, <laughs> right? You know, so it's kind of actually it's kind of cool. Yeah, they, and by the way, they don't expire or anything. No, no, and, and I was just actually was just about to say is estate planning, it's a one and done. Yeah. That, that, again, everything I'm saying here has like this asterisk next to it, right? Like, yeah. like it's one and done in the sense that, I mean, you should always address your estate plan. Your life is changing always. Oh. People die. I guess I people pass away. You move houses. Yep. You acquire a new business. You acquire new property. Yeah, you get divorced or something. You get divorced. You should look to your documents. Yeah. Because they most likely have to be updated at that point. Right. So so it isn't just like put it on the shelf and disappear. But but like you don't a trust don't require like an annual fee. And there are firms that charge annual fees. Oh, oh, you did this with us. You have to pay for a service plan. Oh, that's or, a good idea for attorneys. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> great. It's, it's great because you because a year after you paid me this money, yeah. I I analyze the very document that I drafted for you and say, yeah. looks good. Yeah, yeah, pay me pay me two hundred fifty bucks yeah, for so that. Still married? Anybody die? Right, new kids? Cool. Right, you're see good. You next, see you next year. Right. So there are some gimmicky stuff out there. Yeah. Um. 
my clients always ask me, okay, so do we need to like schedule like a follow up with you? And I say, if I'm being honest with you, no. Yeah. Like theoretically, you never have to come see me again. But when something changes, yeah, let me know and 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 I'll give you some answers. Man, attorneys, it's a little bit like mechanics. Like it's such. There's probably a reason they have this reputation, and that is, it it really probably is could be easy to take advantage of oh, people because totally. they don't know. And like in this instance you're like almost begging the attorney, like, please protect me. How much, what will it take? And, right. and in some ways it's like costs don't matter at that moment. And so it would be very easy for an attorney to like, well, you know, <laughs> you hit the nail right on the head. Ready for this? Why? And if you're, if your listeners didn't get anything else out of this, this is what I'd want them to get out of it. Why can attorneys charge people so much money? Because you're calling the attorney at the wrong time. It, as, just like a, a mechanic, if you roll into a sleepy town oh, with a right. with a blown radiator at midnight, right? Yeah, it's going to cost like six times what it would have cost you to get it fixed in the first place. Oh, but, well, when you call an attorney, uh, you have a your family's fighting and and someone sued you and you have to respond to a demand letter in two days. Yeah, That's you, interesting. You're, you're gonna. Yeah, you're right because the retainer for like some family law could be twenty five hundred right. bucks on the same estate, whereas the entire estate plan, preemptively, like an oil change right. in, to the analogy, right. no big deal. Whereas once the you know the parents pass away and the family cap, what whatever it yeah. is, all of a sudden it's like the time for planning is right. gone, and now it's war. Well, perfect example: a contractor, right? You're a home builder. Okay, you don't have to have an attorney review your contract. Yeah. That that you sign that when you sign up a new client to do a remodel, you don't ha- an attorney doesn't have to review that. You're fine. Right up until your deal goes south. Yeah. And that contract stinks. Now, instead of paying an attorney, let's say $1500 to crank out a good form contract for you, now you're paying $50,000 to fix the bad contract because now you're in litigation, yeah. and 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 that happened. I have a client right now. He, um, um, his wife died. He, he's an older gentleman, but his wife died semi unexpectedly, and um, he said he was just emotionally ruined and distraught, and he said he had just enough time to bury his wife, and his truck was waiting in his driveway with his toy hauler on the back, and he said. I got out of there. I was done, right? Like, I had to go be alone. I was so heartbroken and ruined. I jumped in, jumped in my truck, got my toy hauler, and I drove across the country for three months. He said, before I left, I went by this law firm and I told them I have to get my estate plan in order now that she's gone. And in his emotionally weak and ruined state, they said, just give us your estate plan. We're going to fix this all for you. And and um, when he got back, the invoice, and I, I, ha- I took a photocopy of the invoice and I like sit it on my desk as a reminder. They, they charged this little old guy just under $14,000 to, to quote unquote fix his trust. A year later, he came back to me and said, was that like honest? Like I was just in an emotionally weak state. I didn't know what to do. I just wanted someone to take care of it. And he said, what would you have charged me to do this same thing? And I said, um, "I said to be honest with you, I said, I probably would have charged you about 14. And he goes, oh, so about the same 14. Th-. I said, no, 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 $1,400. Yeah. $1,400. <laughs> and he's like, what? And I said, yeah. And, and I showed him, I said, this is what I would have done for you. And I said, it would have been $1,400. <laughs> and he goes, I thought you meant 14,000. I'm like, no, man, like, I, I'm sorry. You just, they, they saw you in this vulnerable state. You were in a panic and they just, and they said, yeah, we'll do all this for you. And this is what it's going to take now that you have waited um, at this moment to do it. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> in fact, he just that, came, yeah. that's the worst. Uh, that that happened to me once. I can't remember. I think it was a swimming pool. I'd never done a swimming pool remodel before. Yeah. And the guy, and I got this bid from the guy, and he said like it'll probably be about five. <laughs> and I was, what does that mean? And I was trying to like keep my poker <laughs> right. face, you know, and be like, ooh, I don't know if I could do five. And I'm just like, crap, five hundred, five thousand. Ah, man. Right. <laughs> and if if he had said five thousand, I would have been like, whew. 
Right. Oh, bummer. It was 500. Yeah. But it was like, that's how little I knew about right. that in that particular industry. And that's the trades. Totally. Anyway, so with kind of like dental work or something you can't see or estate planning or these things, it's like you can get away with uh, some real dishonest. I can't say it's dishonest. I don't know. Maybe those attorneys, for some reason, that's how they run their business. And well, who, who knows? But anyways. Well, not to defend these guys. Yeah. Not to defend these attorneys, but but I am going to <laughs> here in just a minute. You're the one hiring them. You're you're. They're saying. Yeah. I mean, you you're two Americans that are forming a contract, and they're saying, "I'll do it for this," and then you say yes. Right. And they, like <laughs> for example, it, I'll defend them even more. It could be that they're so busy at that moment right. doing estate planning that they like didn't want to do it. This is an example. And like, and so they've been raising their prices for a year, and and that's just where they're at because they've got so much work they don't want it, and it's I'm only going to do it if it's worth it, and I'm going right. to bill eight hundred bucks an hour. It's the only reason it's worth it for me, you know, something like that. Right. It, it may not have been as malicious and, as like. And let me tell look you, at this old guy. Let's get let's get him. Let me tell you, I, I'm not. Um, you know, we we have a good size law firm. It started off like me at a desk in my bedroom, yeah. running my law firm, and you know now we're a pretty big law firm. I tell you, well, <laughs> me and my partners to this day, we laugh that that when we we teamed up and started the firm we have today. The phone would ring, and I'm telling you, I'll never forget. This guy called in about like tax liens, and, and he called in the morning and said, "Do you guys do tax lien uh, law?" And I said, "Uh, you know, can I call you back?" And, and he's like, "Sure." And I took his number down, and I ran down the hall to two of my partners, and I said, "You guys have to figure out how to do tax liens yeah. by this afternoon." And they're like, <laughs> "Okay," and they like start researching. And da, da, da. Yeah. The guy calls back a few hours later. He's like, "Hey, you haven't called me back yet. I need to know right now." And, and he's like, "Do you do tax liens?" I said, "Hold on." And I put my hand over the phone. I looked at them down the hall, and they're all they're sticking their thumbs up. We do it. Yeah. We do it now. And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, we do tax liens." <laughs> you know, that was the early days of practicing law, yeah. and and now, th- th- I mean grateful for everything we have I, yeah. I truly am and i'm grateful for even the small stuff that comes in but it's like we have some people who call in with the littlest problems and they'll call me five times in one day and say do you want my business or not you know it's like and 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 that and i get to the point where i say sure it'll be yeah. six times what i normally would have charged you because yeah. you're calling me and you you want it now yeah and, th- and that's i mean any contractor would yeah. can, can hopefully sympathize with that well that's what i like when i get a bid or something from a contractor that's way more than i in fact i had a guy give a price to trim some trees and it was like three thousand dollars you right. know not not a huge job but and the answer was not like that greedy bum is like huh he must not have really wanted to trim these trees right. very bad right and i didn't hire him and he didn't care because yeah. he obviously didn't want to trim the trees all that bad and if in order to make it worth the time, he would have charged three thousand bucks. That's fair right. enough, you know. That's uh, right. So I that's, mean, you got to hear what we all have to hear what we're saying. Yeah, he's not saying he's not saying this is how much I cost. He's saying this is how busy I am, yeah. and this is what it's going to take. Yeah, <laughs> prices are the coolest. I mean, we'll have to pivot before we uh, stick on prices and defend a bunch of these greedy <laughs> capitalist pigs. <laughs> but pi- prices are so cool when right. you kind of like understand what is that number? It's a language. At least a, on a macro sense. And don't look at any one particular price because there's certainly abuse. But yeah. All right, CJ. Well, thanks for coming on. Anything to leave? We'll put your uh, w- websites and law firm. Can estate planning be done across state lines? Yeah, it's a little tricky. The short answer is yes. Um, there's some caveats to that, okay. but, but yes, I mean, you know, and we're, I, I'm still kind of one of those weird lawyers who I'm happy to answer questions yeah. for folks. So anyone has questions. Yeah. Happy to answer That's cool. Them. I know like, um, uh, IP law can also be done cross yeah. state lines. A few yeah. things I know, which actually I don't want to talk to an IP guy. Cause I don't really understand that. that that'll be coming down the road. Uh, fellas IP that's I've listened. I, well, you'll hear, we'll hear about it soon, but all right. Well, thanks for coming on. Uh, everybody will catch you next time.